Hi, and welcome to another episode of MD Insight. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. John Rodriguez. Uh, John is Director of Surgical Endoscopy at Cleveland Clinic Main Campus. John, thanks for taking time to be with me today. Thank you, Connor. Really honored by this invitation. No, it's great to have you here. So you do obviously a lot of MIS and a lot of upper GI, particularly surgery, and your practice has evolved into managing a lot of complications, a lot of patients sent in. So it's a really esoteric and interesting practice, but maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and how all that evolved. Sure, so, you know, it's interesting how, how surgery is always a fast moving topic. And I think that, you know, specific for minimally invasive surgery, we, we think about minimally invasive surgery as a way of, you know, minimizing the scars and maximizing recovery for patients. But I think the, the real revolution in MIS surgery over the last uh, few years, and maybe even a decade now, has come through how to really avoid those incisions and kind of do things using natural orifices like the mouth or, or any other, uh, you know, body cavity to try to really eliminate incisions and, and enhance really the recovery for patients. And that's truly what I see as the new barriers of minimal invasive surgery is not these discussions about the robot or the laparoscopic stuff. You know, it's really how do we really kind of revolutionize that industry into something that people are not thinking about right now. Yeah, it's kind of almost shifting paradigms, right? It's not just an incremental gain, but really a, a paradigm shift. And so how did you get exposed to some of that initially? How, where did that come? Was that training? Was it practice? Was it a bit of both? You know, what, what, what were the drivers for you? So I think, you know, we've been very uh, lucky here at the Cleveland Clinic. We've always had a very strong presence of, you know, surgeons and endoscopists, you know, both from the surgical world and the GI world. And I think when you look at the history of, of surgical endoscopy in, in the modern medical era, you know, you hear a lot of the names and have all come from here, you know, starting with Jeff Ponsky putting the first peg, you know, 30 years ago, when I was a resident, uh, we had a dedicated section for surgical endoscopy in the department. And I think that was probably one of the first uh, sections across the country where it was truly a surgeon run uh, endoscopic practice where surgeons were doing true surgery using an endoscope and not just, you know, what we, what we see as, as typical uh, endoscopic procedures. So I think being exposed to that and obviously through mentorship and, and kind of looking at the future, what I wanted to do and I want, how I wanted to impact um, my practice and people's lives and also surgical education, I think to me was a very attractive career at the time. Yeah, well, I can see why. And having Jeff around as an innovator, pioneer, colleague and friend is, is very lucky for all of us, I think. So, um, so obviously you do a lot of the more normal, traditional MIS type upper GI surgeries, but tell us a little bit about some of the techniques or tools you're using now to manage some upper GI complications, because honestly, I think that's become more pervasive and probably more effective in fairness uh, than for those of us in lower GI. Sure. So I think that, you know, using the endoscope has allowed us to really kind of evolve some techniques that have been practiced for many, many years in terms of managing surgical complications all the way from, you know, plugging holes to, to really trying to drain uh, abscess cavities, leaks, things like that, that unfortunately are going to be common in any high risk surgical practice. And I think with the, with the patient population that we treat here at the Cleveland Clinic in terms of being a complex referral center in every single GI specialty that we do, whether it's upper or lower gut uh, surgery, we're always going to be exposed to patients who are going to have a little bit of a high risk of complication. And I think a lot of these high risk operative patients really benefit when there's a complication, even though they're rare or patients that get shipped here from other hospitals. And you can truly try to apply some of these modern techniques in terms of managing leaks and fistulas and, and things like that with an endoscope, avoiding a reoperation, um, sometimes even rescuing an anastomosis or, or something like that using any kind of modern technique, whether it's using clips, stents, some of the more basic things like internal drains and things like that. It's been very, very effective. And for the people that do this, and I think for the surgeons that have someone around that can help with this, it's been a true practice changer. Yeah, I think without doubt. And I, I think one of the other things that's important as part of that, obviously, is the 
collaborative interaction with, uh, well, I guess particularly IOR, so you've got counter drainage and then clips or stents or what have you. I think one of our troubles in colorectal surgery down at the level of the anus is you can't really stent the anus. It just becomes too uncomfortable. Unfortunately, we don't have too many issues above that. Um, but it's really fascinating to see the way it's evolved. So, so those partnerships obviously um, then relay on into other areas. And I know one of the areas you've had a, a great and increasing interest in is uh, upper GI motility and outcomes and gastroparesis more specifically. Uh, maybe it'll tell us a little bit about how that evolved and what direction you think it's heading in now because there's a classical example of advanced use of endoscopic surgical techniques. Yeah, so yeah, I think I think uh, for that this motility, whether it's in the esophagus or the, or the stomach, and you know specifically for me, it's been a lot of focus on the stomach. Is one of those things that it, it's a true problem in the U.S. in terms of of the epidemics of it. Uh, the number of patients has increased quite dramatically over the last 15, 20 years, and the impact it's having in, in our healthcare industry is humongous in the millions of dollars. So. You know, these patients are, are desperate, they're seeking help, and there's not a lot of places that have really true, put together a true dedicated team to help them. And I think that's been one of our strengths here is working as a team across different specialties to really build a home for these patients to come from all over the place so they can get treatment. And specifically, there's a very high failure uh, rate of medical treatment. So a lot of these patients end up needing surgical intervention. And for a very long time, the intervention is really limited to some experimental alternatives, mainly gastric pacing, which obtained an FDA um, humanitarian exemption clearance with no excellent data, I would say, to support its use. And, you know, we, we were doing that for a very long time. And so we kind of started rethinking the box about what to offer these patients. And it came at a time where I think the evolution of minimal invasive techniques uh, was a, a perfect uh in a perfect place. So we were able to quickly transition from doing, you know, laparoscopic emptying procedures to going fully endoscopic. And in the last four or five years, I think we built the largest database of patients undergoing endoscopic pyloromyotomies uh, for gastroparesis. We have close to 600 patients now that have been completed. And nowadays about 90% of these are done outpatient. It's about a 15 to 20 minute endoscopic procedure the risk of complications is, you know, way below 0.4%. Um, the cost is very small, and, and the results that we're seeing in our prospective database has been really comparable to, to nothing out there. It's, it's far superior than the data that has come out from any uh, PACER study and uh, very comparable to our laparoscopic uh, techniques, but a lot safer, uh, a lot cheaper, and a lot lower risk of readmission and reintervention. So... So I think it's really been a practice changer, not just for us, but for a lot of other institutions across the country that have adopted this technology as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we had the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Mike Klein um, a couple of weeks ago, and Mike told us about some of the differential and the workup pathways. And I know he and his team have been a, a big uh, collaborator and partner with you guys um, on the endoscopic side. Maybe you talk briefly about what the endoscopic procedure is and how you do it. Sure. So it's a, it's a new concept in mainly invasive surgery that we call intramural surgery. So we always think about organs as, you know, you're either outside or inside of the organ, but in intramural surgery, you're actually in the wall of the organ, in this case, you know, the stomach. So if you think about the stomach, it has different layers like an onion. So you're going to have, you know, different layers of muscle and you're going to have your mucosa and your submucosa. So we use, um, you know, a, a blue uh, dyed uh, fluid, whether it's saline or some of the modern, modern uh, composites, to create a bleb, make an incision just in the mucosa, so we completely respect the other layers of the of the stomach um, or the esophagus when we do it in the esophagus. We get into that submucosal plane, and we can really advance uh, with the endoscope in that submucosal plane for as long as you want, um, and we're able to identify specific parts. In this case, we, we specifically identify the pylorus, which, you know, quite honestly, when I'm teaching this to the fellows on the residents, it looks just like a calamari ring. So I always tell them, just look for the calamari ring. And once you can see it uh, in a very precise fashion, you can limit the, the myotomy to just the pyloric ring, you know, those uh, circular fibers that are crossing, and respect the, the rest of the wall, which, you know, has a huge role in, in how motility works. And... Um, 
you come back, you post a mucosa, and, and it's truly a phenomenal thing. And, and, you know, I think we've all been surprised about how well these procedures work and how the, the body recovers from them, you know, in a, in a very fast uh, fashion. Yeah, it's revolutionary. And we're starting to use that plane a little bit in colorectal too with ESD and polyps and things like that. But the concept of dividing muscle through it uh, for upper GI motility is super. And obviously it's working for the Zenkers type procedures too. So changing gears just a little bit, John, uh, maybe you'd tell us how you're spinning that into research because I think you're on the verge of a, a very significant research accomplishment you might want to tell us about. Sure. So I think it's one of the key things that needs to come with innovation. I think it's one of the challenges that we always see as physicians, especially in interventional specialties, where something new comes. And I think there's a there's a period where you you're excited about the innovation, but you're unclear about whether it's going to work or not. So I think that we've always been very transparent, and you know we we've been very aggressive about publishing our data from very early on, both good and bad, and, and trying to share our experience. And I think with what we've done so far, it really built a great platform to think about kind of the bigger picture. So we were very uh, fortunate and grateful with the NIH that we received the NARO1 grant where we're going to be doing a, um, an endoscopic myotomy versus a sham trial, which I think is a critical study design when you're uh, studying new techniques like this one to really prove whether they work or not. And I think looking at the big picture, not just from a scientific standpoint, where I think it's important for us to, to, to see this and prove this, is also for the other side of healthcare, which is, you know, insurance and coverage and things like that, that it's important for the insurance companies that are evaluating these procedures and, and making it accessible to our patients, that they truly look at good quality data and, and that proves that this is either a superior or equivalent uh, alternative to what we're currently doing. So... I think that uh, by building this, this uh, prospective trial and, and transparently publishing our data, we're going to be able to, again, validate the, 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 the success of the procedure and also have a stronger uh, kind of publication to help insurance companies understand that this is going to be something critical for our patients who are suffering from gastroparesis. Well, congratulations to you and the team. I mean, you're truly to be applauded for that. There aren't a whole lot of sham trials in surgery, and this is really innovative and will be really important. And I think we all look forward to seeing it in a, a really big journal in episodes to come. But not to be uh, done with uh, advanced endoscopy and changing surgical techniques and NIH funding and stuff like that. You're also thinking of changing directions with your career and um, uh, still as part of the clinic enterprise, which uh, I'm certainly delighted about, but maybe you tell us about next steps and uh, moving eastwards. Sure. So, you know, I think um, I think for someone like me who has been for a very long time in the Cleveland Clinic, I trained here, I did my residency, my fellowship, and I've been on staff since. Um, you know, it's always exciting to see how, how an institution and an enterprise really focuses on healthcare at a different level. And, you know, I think as as that happens and you learn and you look at leadership and opportunities, you know, there's always kind of things opening up and, and exciting adventures for us to, to fill. And, you know, lately in the last uh, year or so, it became, um, it became an opportunity for me at our Far East campus, you know, a little bit past Hillcrest, uh, when you get all the way to the Middle East. So I, I accepted a position as chair of surgery in Abu Dhabi, um, which is truly, you know, leading the, the Cleveland Clinic uh, impact in the Middle East in terms of building a true academic hospital with, you know, not just outstanding patient care, which is something that we're well known for, but also uh, revolutionizing education. So, you know, starting looking at residency, affiliation into medical schools, uh, starting fellowship lines, and truly becoming a reference center in the region. So for me, it was a very exciting opportunity not just personally, but also for my family in terms of, you know, them living that experience of, of learning a different culture, different languages, and, and living abroad. So um, it's a lot of mixed emotions. Uh, I've been here for a long time, and, you know, I'm a, a very supportive environment, and I've been very grateful to work with my colleagues and, and you know, my, my supervisors, both you and Matt Walsh, but I think it's going to be a, a new uh, step in my career, and I'm very excited about it. Yeah, I'm incredibly excited for you and 
proud and I, I think Abu Dhabi are, are lucky to have you join the team and I know Matt Crow's very excited to have you heading over there too. And I'm just happy that we can keep you as part of the broader digestive disease and surgery family and you know when we think of the Cleveland area and Florida area and Abu Dhabi and soon London it's, it's incredibly exciting to think of how we're scaling across the world. But really looking forward John to seeing all you can accomplish there. I know your passion about educating others in the new things you're doing and um, you are a space to be watched and a force to be reckoned with. So thanks again for taking time to chat today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Connor.